Hey guys, this is Duong. If you guys remember, I made a video called The Church Fathers Teach the Filioque, where I definitively show the consensus of the Church Fathers both East and West taught the Filioque. I actually dropped this video right before I entered the monastery. After a year of being a monk, I left the monastery due to medical reasons. But on the way out, I saw that Craig Truglia made a response to my video. At first, I planned not to make a response video since I believe that his video was insufficient at addressing the arguments presented and because I was outside of the apologetic sphere for nearly a year. But time and time again, I've had people messaging me about it. And just like in Luke's Gospel, where we see the friend who was awakened at midnight, who was requested three loaves, didn't budge until his friend perseveringly annoyed him to the point of helping. So too, you guys annoyed me to the point where I finally felt compelled to make this video. So in this video, I will refute Craig Truglia's video the Church Fathers did not teach the Filioque. So let's begin. At the 45 second mark, Truglia accuses me of quote mining. From a content standpoint, it comes across as quote mining. Now this is a typical scenario that occurs when arguing with Eastern Orthodox apologists. If you don't use arguments from the Fathers, they will say your argument is not patristic, bro. When we back up our claims from the Fathers, they will say quote mining or forgery. At this point, being called a quote miner by an Eastern Orthodox apologist is a badge of honor. It means they can't handle your patristic evidence. In other words, we have the consensus of the fathers. I personally infer, doesn't mean I'm right, I'm not God, but I infer that he did not read the entire text that he's quoting and philosophizing and making inferences from. And even sometimes, he didn't even read the paragraphs in which these texts are lifted from. Furthermore, it is ironic that Craig is saying that I didn't read the text or the paragraph of the content I provided, as I will show that he doesn't even understand the very paragraphs he quotes. In his video, he quotes paragraphs from St. Augustine's On the Trinity, where St. Augustine explicitly teaches the Filioque, and Craig Truglia attempts to use this as a proof against the Filioque. Now at the 1 minute and 17 second mark, he says every proof text I use for the first three fathers is wrong. If he gets every single proof text wrong in his first three examples, it's a good sampling of what the entirety of his work offers. So he's trying to imply that I misread the fathers, and because I misread three of the fathers, this means my entire work is dubious. Now, even if I misinterpreted the first three fathers, which I didn't, he still can't deal with many of the fathers I quote, who literally assert that the hypostatic property of the Spirit is that he proceeds from the Father and the Son. Take, for example, St. Fulgentius, in Epistola 10.4, he says, quote, It is the property of the Father alone that he was not born, but begot. It is the property of the Son that he did not beget, but was born. It is the property of the Holy Spirit that he neither begot nor was born, but proceeded from the begetter and the begotten. End quote. There's no way to escape this. The saint asserts that the hypostatic property of the Holy Spirit is that he proceeds from the Father and the Son. No amount of economic procession or eternal manifestation can allow you to escape this. Or take, for example, St. Davidus of Vienne, who in Epistle 4 says, quote, We, for our part, affirm that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. It is the property of the Holy Spirit to proceed from the Father and the Son. Es proprium spiritu is sancto o patri filioque, end quote. So the hypostatic property of the Holy Spirit is that he proceeds from the Father and the Son. Not eternal manifestation, nor economic procession. Why didn't Craig Truglia deal with this father? Or St. Faustus of Rez in Holy Spirit chapter 13 who says, If you want to know what is the difference between the one who is born and the one that proceeds, it naturally depends on the first being the only son of the father, while the second derives its origin from the father and the son. End quote. So the distinction between the son and the spirit is that the spirit derives its origin from the Father and the Son. Clearly no amount of cope can escape that this is regarding hypostatic origin. Or St. Isidore of Seville in Etymologies 738 who says, Between the Son who is born and the Spirit who proceeds is this distinction, that the Son is born from one. The Holy Spirit proceeds from both. Spiritus Sanctus ex utroque brucedit. End quote. Clearly Craig cannot deal with these other fathers, I quote, because there's no way for him to interpret these fathers according to the Eastern Orthodox position outlined by the Council of Blackrne. He must admit that they teach the Filioque. Now, rather than engaging with these fathers, he tries to accuse me of misinterpreting the first three fathers and therefore implying all my work is dubious. Not only is he wrong, but this is such a bad move since it's clear there's no way that the Eastern Orthodox can read these Latin fathers in line with their theology. That aside, I do properly interpret the fathers. 
So let's rewatch the first argument I make from St. Augustine. In Tractate 99, on John chapter 16, verse 13, chapter 4, he writes, quote, Accordingly, he shall not speak of himself, because he is not of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall we speak. He shall hear of him from whom he proceeds. To him hearing is knowing, but knowing is being, as has been discussed above. Because then, he is not of himself, but of him from whom he proceeds, and of whom he has essence, of him he has knowledge. From him, therefore, he has hearing, which is nothing else than knowledge. So we see here that St. Augustine says that from whom he proceeds, and of whom he has essence, of him he has knowledge. From him, therefore, he has hearing. And this is speaking about John 16, 13. Now let's go to John 16, 13 and see what it says. John chapter 16, verses 13 to 15 says, When the Spirit of truth comes, he shall guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Christ says that the Holy Spirit will receive hearing from him. But according to St. Augustine, from whom he has hearing, that same person has knowledge. And if he has knowledge from that person, then he has essence from that person. But if he has essence from that person, then he proceeds from that person. So if the Holy Spirit has hearing from the Son, then he has knowledge from the Son. And that means he has essence from the Son. And therefore he proceeds from the Son. But didn't the Council of Blackernay say, There's no other hypostasis in the Trinity except the Father's from which the existence and essence of the consubstantial, the Son and the Holy Spirit, is derived. So clearly, St. Augustine is a filioquist. Now the first point Truglia makes against my argument comes at the three minute mark, where he asserts, John 16 does not say the Spirit receives hearing from the Son. We could see of John 16, 13 to 15, Duong says that this passage indicates that the Spirit acquires hearing from the Son, something it does not actually say, by the way. Now this is blatantly false. The entire consensus of the Fathers is that John 16 is about the Holy Spirit receiving hearing from the Son. St. Ambrose, in sermon on the giving up of the basilicas, says, quote, All things that the Father hath are mine. Also of the Holy Spirit, saying, That the Spirit is Christ, and has received of Christ. As it is written, He shall receive of mine, and shall declare it unto you. John 16, 14. End quote. Clearly, St. Ambrose believes the Holy Spirit receives knowledge from the Son. As he says, The Holy Spirit receives from Christ, quoting John 16, 14, which is about the reception of hearing from the Son. St. Athanasius in Discourse Against the Arians 1, chapter 12 says, quote, And indeed the Lord himself said, The Spirit shall take of mine, and I will send him, and to his disciples receive the Holy Ghost. And if, as the Lord himself has said, the Spirit is his and takes of his, and he sends it. End quote. Here again we have St. Athanasius believing that the Holy Spirit receives knowledge from the Son, quoting John 16. St. Gregory of Nyssa in On the Holy Spirit Against the Macedonians says, quote, he, the Holy Spirit, ever searches the deep things of God, ever receives from the Son. End quote. Clearly, St. Gregory thinks that the Holy Spirit receives from the Son from all eternity. St. Cyril of Alexandria, in On the Gospel According to John, Book 11, Chapter 1, says, quote, In this way, then, the statement that his Spirit receives something from the Only Begotten is wholly unimpeachable and cannot be cavilled at. For proceeding naturally as his attribute through him, and having all that he has in its entirety, he is said to receive that which he has." End quote. So St. Cyril thinks that the Holy Spirit is receiving all things from Christ, based off of John 16. So clearly St. Cyril also believes that the Holy Spirit receives knowledge from Christ. Furthermore, St. Cyril of Jerusalem, St. Leo, St. Epiphanius, and St. Hilary also all agree that John 16 is about the Holy Spirit receiving from the Son. So here we see that Craig Truglia is already wrong in going against the patristic consensus. John 16 is about the Holy Spirit receiving knowledge from the Son. Now at the 3 minute 28 second mark, Truglia claims, I juxtapose my own logic to the text. Duong's take on Augustine is wrong because he seems to interpret quotes in isolation, juxtaposing his own logic onto the text instead of that posed by the author in the same work. As we shall see, this is an interpretive error Duong regrettably makes repeatedly. Now I showed the arguments that the fathers were making. Furthermore, even if I do juxtapose my own logic to the text, it doesn't undermine the truth of the argument, as it shows that the filioque is a result of patristic principles. Now it would be false to claim that the fathers taught the filioque if it was just a juxtaposition of my own logic, but I believe that I show the very arguments the fathers are making, or the logical conclusions of their positions, so I do not concede this point. Now at the 6 minute 16 second mark, Truglia states, Augustine's point is that the essence is simple, and a person of the Trinity receiving an attribute from another person means that person receives the divine essence from the person he receives the attribute from. 
In short, Augustine's point, whether you agree with it or not, is that a simple essence or substance is and must be identical with what it has, knowledge, love, life, etc. This applies to hypostatic causality in that when the scriptures teach an attribute of the Father, such as life, is given to another divine hypostasis, this therefore pertains to the hypostatic causality of the hypostasis of the Son or Spirit from the Father. This is true. All the fathers will say that the Holy Spirit receives divine attributes from the Son. Well, what does this mean? Well, according to St. Augustine, this clearly means that the Holy Spirit receives the divine essence from the Son and therefore proceeds from Him. For example, St. Cyr of Alexandria in On the Gospel according to John book 11 chapter 1 says, quote, In this way then, the statement that His Spirit receives something from the Only Begotten is wholly unimpeachable and cannot be caviled at. For proceeding naturally as His attribute through Him and having all that He has in its entirety, He is said to receive that which He has. End quote. So St. Cyril recognizes the Holy Spirit receives all things from the Son. Therefore, the Spirit's property is that He proceeds from the Father through the Son. He's using St. Augustine's logic, showing that the Holy Spirit must receive the divine essence from or through the Son, which is something that is condemned by the Eastern Orthodox Council of Blackerne. And St. Athanasius, who in Discourse 3 against the Arians, chapter 25, paragraph 24, says, quote, For He, as has been said, gives to the Spirit, and whatever the Spirit has, He has from the Word. End quote. What does this mean according to the principle laid out by St. Augustine? If the Spirit receives all things from the Son, and reception of any attribute entails reception of essence, it means the Holy Spirit receives the divine essence from the Son. Or St. Gregory of Nyssa, who in On the Holy Spirit against the Macedonians says, quote, He, the Holy Spirit, ever searches the deep things of God, ever receives from the Son. End quote. If the Holy Spirit is always receiving from the Son, he eternally proceeds from him, according to St. Augustine. So just working off of this principle laid out by St. Augustine, we see that if we use the sayings of the Fathers, we are logically led to the Filioque, and not to Eastern Orthodox pneumatology. At the 7 minute 58 second mark, Craig claims that the logic I showed used by St. Augustine doesn't actually apply to the Son. Rather, he says that St. Augustine only applies this logic to the Father. Following the logic of the passage, the Spirit is of the Father, or he would not have knowledge. Therefore, his essence is of the Father. Augustine at no point applies his logic to the Spirit being caused by the Son. In short, the interpretation Duong poses actually contradicts the point Augustine makes, which is why Duong juxtaposes his own interpretation of John 16 onto what Augustine is actually saying. While St. Augustine immediately applies the logic to the Father, if you read the following chapters, you see that he extends the logic to the Son. Tractate 99.4 says, quote, But it cannot be so with a divine substance, for it is what it has. And on this account, it has not knowledge in any such way, as that the knowledge whereby it knows should be to it one thing, and the essence whereby it exists another, but both are one. Accordingly, he shall not speak of himself, because he is not of himself. But whatever he shall hear, that shall he speak. He shall hear of him from whom he proceeds. To him hearing is knowing, but knowing is being, as has been discussed above, because then he is not of himself, but of him from whom he proceeds, and of whom he has essence, of him he has knowledge, from him therefore he has hearing, which is nothing else than knowledge." End quote. So here in Tractate 99, 4, we see that St. Augustine's logic for John 16, 13 to 15 is that according to divine simplicity, knowledge is identical with the divine essence. So if the Holy Spirit receives knowledge from someone, he receives the divine essence from that person, and therefore he divinely proceeds from that person. Now, St. Augustine applies this to the Father at first, but as we already shown, the text in John 16 says the Holy Spirit receives from the Son. So St. Augustine will extend this logic to the Son. Now let's move on to Tractate 99.5. Quote, And be not disturbed by the fact that the verb is put in the future tense, for it is not said, Whatsoever he has heard, or whatsoever he hears, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. For such hearing is everlasting, because the knowing is everlasting. But in the case of what is eternal, without beginning and without end, in whatever tense the verb is put, whether in the past or present or future, there is no falsehood thereby implied. The Holy Spirit therefore is always hearing, because he always knows. Ergo, he both knew and knows and will know. And in the same way, he both heard and hears, and will hear. For as we have already said, to him hearing is one with knowing, and knowing with him is one with being. From him therefore he heard and hears, and will hear, of whom he is, and of him he is, from whom he proceeds." End quote. So in Tractate 99.5, 
We see St. Augustine says that the hearing from John 16, 13 to 15 is eternal, meaning he reads John 16, 13 to 15 as revealing the imminent trinity, not merely an economic procession, qua economic procession. The Holy Spirit hearing from someone means he always receives knowledge from him and therefore always receives the divine essence from him. Now from this conclusion, he applies this logic to the Son and asks whether the Spirit proceeds from the Son then, since the Holy Spirit is said to receive hearing from the Son, and therefore knowledge and essence. So in Tractate 99.6 he says, quote, Someone may here inquire whether the Holy Spirit proceeds also from the Son, for the Son is Son of the Father alone, and the Father is Father of the Son alone, but the Holy Spirit is not the Spirit of one of them, but of both. You have the Lord himself saying, For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of the Father that speaks in you. Matthew 10, 20. And you have the Apostle, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts. Galatians 4, 6. Are there then two, the one of the Father and the other of the Son? Certainly not, for there is one body, he said, when referring to the church, and presently added, and one Spirit. And mark how he there make up the Trinity. As you are called, he says, in one hope of your calling, one Lord, where he certainly meant Christ to be understood, but it is remained that he should also name the Father, and accordingly there follows one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Ephesians 4, 4-6 And since then, just as there is one Father and one Lord, namely the Son, so also there is one Spirit. He is doubtless of both, especially as Christ Jesus himself says, the Spirit of your Father that dwells in you. And the Apostle declares, God has sent forth the Spirit of the Son into your hearts. You have the same Apostle saying in another place, but if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, where he certainly intended that the Spirit of the Father to be understood, of whom whoever he says in another place, but if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his, and many other testimonies there are, which plainly show that he who in the Trinity is styled the Holy Spirit is the Spirit both of the Father and the Son." End quote. So here we see that St. Augustine is questioning if the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son, as he says, quote, "...someone may here inquire whether the Holy Spirit proceeds also from the Son, for the Son is Son of the Father alone, and the Father is Father of the Son alone, but the Holy Spirit is not the Spirit of one of them, but of both." End quote. Clearly this is questioning with regards to the hypostatic procession and not the economic procession since we already know that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son economically. That's not something St. Augustine denies. He affirms this everywhere. Just read on the Trinity. So the question is whether the Spirit being called Spirit of the Son indicates the Spirit having hypostatic origin from the Son. That's the question. It's about whether the genitive or possessive case reveals the imminent trinity. The Son is Son of the Father because he hypostatically proceeds from the Father. The Spirit is the Spirit of the Father and the Son. Now does this reveal that he hypostatically proceeds from both? That's the question at hand. Remember, this is following Tractate 99, 4-5, which talks about the Spirit receiving hearing from the Son, indicating he forever receives the divine essence from the Son. So this isn't some off-topic tangent. Rather, St. Augustine is applying the logic from John 16, 13 to 15, where the Holy Spirit receives knowledge from the Son, and is connecting this with the Spirit being called the Spirit of the Son, and is now asking if the Spirit has hypostatic origin from the Son. The entire context is about the economy revealing the imminent trinity. Now let's move on to Tractate 99.7 and 99.8. Tractate 99.7, quote, Why then should we not believe that the Holy Spirit proceeds also from the Son, seeing that he is likewise the Spirit of the Son? For did he not so proceed? He could not, when showing himself to his disciples after the resurrection, have breathed upon him and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. For what else was signified by such a breathing upon them, but that from him also the Holy Spirit proceeds? End quote. Tractate 99.8, quote, if then the Holy Spirit proceeds both from the Father and from the Son, why, said the Son, he proceeds from the Father? Why do you think? But just because it is to him, he is wont to attribute even that which is his own, of whom he himself also is. Hence we have him saying, My doctrine is not my own, but his that sent me. If therefore in such a passage we are to understand that as his doctrine, which nevertheless he declared not to be his own, but the Father's, how much more in the other passage are we to understand the Holy Spirit as proceeding from himself, where his words, he proceeds from the Father, were uttered, so as not to imply that he proceeds not from me, but from him of whom the Son has, is that he is God, for he is God of God. He certainly has it from him, also that the Holy Spirit proceeds, and in this way, the Holy Spirit has it of the Father himself, that he should also proceed from the Son, even as he proceeds from the Father." End quote. So in Tractate 99.7, the Holy Spirit is said to hypostatically proceed from the Son, and this is signified in the economic procession of the Spirit from the Son. Then after asking whether the Spirit hypostatically proceeds from the Son, because he's called the Spirit of the Son, St. Augustine affirms that the Holy Spirit proceeds from both. The entire context is about the Spirit hypostatically proceeding from both, grounded upon what happens in the economy. When St. Augustine says, quote, If then the Holy Spirit proceeds both from the Father and the Son, 
Why, said the Son, he proceeds from the Father. End quote. We see that he quotes John 15, 26. Now, John 15, 26 is trying to reveal something about the imminent Trinity or the imminent procession of the Spirit from the Father. Meaning the question St. Augustine is asking is that if the Holy Spirit hypothetically proceeds from both, why do the scriptures attest to the Spirit hypothetically proceeding from the Father? Then St. Augustine explains this by saying that the Son says his doctrine is not his own, but rather it's the Father's, even though it's technically still his own. Likewise, the Son says the Holy Spirit hypothetically proceeds from the Father, not to exclude the Holy Spirit hypothetically proceeding from the Son. Then St. Augustine says, quote, But from him, of whom the Son has it that he is God, for he is God of God, he certainly has it that from him also the Holy Spirit proceeds. And in this way, the Holy Spirit has it of the Father himself, that he should also proceed from the Son, even as he proceeds from the Father, end quote. So the Son is communicated the spiration of the Spirit, because he is God from God, meaning the Father communicates spiration to the Son through begetting. And he says, quote, In this way, the Holy Spirit has it of the Father himself, that he should also proceed from the Son, even as he proceeds from the Father, end quote. So the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son is because the Father gave it to the Son. And the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son, even as he proceeds from the Father, meaning there's one single spiration. It's clearly showing that the Father in begetting the Son gives the spiration of the Spirit to the Son. Then in Tractate 99.9, he says, Quote, in connection with this, we come also to some understanding of the further point, that is, so far as it could be understood by such beings as ourselves, why the Holy Spirit is not said to be born, but to proceed. Since if he also were called by the name of Son, he could not avoid being called the Son of both, which is utterly absurd. For no one is the Son of two, unless of a father and a mother, but it would be utterly abhorrent to entertain the suspicion of any such intervention between God the Father and God the Son. For not even a son of human parents proceeds at the same time from the father and the mother, but at the same time that he proceeds from the father into the mother. It is not that he proceeds from the mother, and when he comes forth from the mother into the light of day, it is not then that he proceeds from the father. But the Holy Spirit proceeds not from the father into the Son, and then proceeds from the Son to the work of the creature's sanctification, but he proceeds at the same time from both. Although this the Father has given unto the Son, that he should proceed from him also, even as he proceeds from himself. And as little can we say that the Holy Spirit is not the life, seeing that the Father is the life, and the Son is the life, and in the same way as the Father, who has life in himself, has given to the Son also to have life in himself, so has he also given that the life should proceed from him, even as it also proceeds from himself. But we come now to the words of our Lord that follow, when he says, And he will show you the things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. But as the present discourse has already been protracted to some length, they must be left over another. End quote. Notice at the beginning he says, quote, why the Holy Spirit is not said to be born, but to proceed, end quote. So the procession we are speaking about is contrasted with the begetting of the Son. Clearly, the begetting of the Son is not an economic procession. Rather, it's an imminent divine procession. So the procession of the Holy Spirit from both is in context of an imminent divine procession. We see St. Augustine say, quote, If he also were called by the name of the Son, he could not avoid being called the Son of both, which is utterly absurd, end quote. So if the Holy Spirit had hypostatic origin from begetting, he would be begotten by both. Why? Because the scriptures attest to the fact that he proceeds from both hypostatically. But clearly the Holy Spirit's procession is distinct from generation. So we do not call the Spirit the Son of both, since he is not a son at all. But this attests to the fact that St. Augustine clearly sees the Holy Spirit has hypostatic origin from both the Father and the Son. This is the entire logic that St. Augustine is using. The father-mother analogy that St. Augustine brings up is about hypostatic origin. Now he contrasts the procession of the Holy Spirit from both as distinct from the father and the mother producing the child because the father and the mother producing the child aren't one principle at the same time. Rather, it proceeds from the father to the mother and then to the child. Whereas St. Augustine is saying the Holy Spirit proceeds from both from the same time. So clearly, if he's using the father-mother analogy, he's talking about the Holy Spirit having hypostatic origin from both. St. Augustine then says, But the Holy Spirit proceeds not from the Father into the Son, and then proceeds from the Son to the work of the creature's sanctification, but he proceeds at the same time from both. Although this the Father has given unto the Son, that he should proceed from him also, even as he proceeds from himself. End quote. So St. Augustine is saying that the Holy Spirit does not proceed from the Father into the Son, as if the Son were some target. Neither is the procession an economic sending from the Son to the creature's sanctification. Rather, he hypostatically proceeds from both, because the Father has given this to the Son by begetting him. Remember, the context is about the Holy Spirit hypostatically proceeding, as this was contrasted with the begetting of the Son. 
and the entire question was whether the genitive case revealed the imminent origin, and the entire background logic was that John 16 says that the Holy Spirit receives hearing from the Son, so shouldn't this mean that the Holy Spirit receives knowledge and essence from the Son from all eternity, and therefore proceed from Him? Then St. Augustine says, quote, And as little can we say that the Holy Spirit is not the life, seeing that the Father is the life and the Son is the life, and in the same way as the Father, who has life in Himself, has given the Son also to have life in Himself, so has He also given that life should proceed from Him, even as it also proceeds from himself, end quote. So the Holy Spirit's hypostatic existence is the life. Remember, Tractate 99.4 says, As the Father has life in himself, and he himself is not something different from the life that is in him, so has he given the Son to have life in himself, that is, has begotten the Son. So the life refers to the person's existence, and receiving life from another means divinely proceeding from that person. Now the Father gave the life, which is the Holy Spirit's hypostatic existence, to proceed from the Son, in a like manner that the Father gave the Son to have life or existence in Himself. Meaning, the Father in generating the Son, or giving the divine essence of the Son, has given the procession of the Holy Spirit to the Son. That's exactly what this text means. And he justifies this by quoting John 16, 13 to 15, clearly vindicating the logic I use. The Holy Spirit receives hearing from the Son, therefore He receives knowledge and essence from the Son, therefore He proceeds from the Son. So the logic I use in my video is a completely accurate representation of the logic St. Augustine used in Tractate 99. So my original argument is completely sound and proven by Tractate 99. In short, Craig Truglia has a completely false reading of St. Augustine's Tractate 99, and this shows you cannot trust his interpretation. But before we move on, I have a question for any Eastern Orthodox listeners. Should you listen to Photius the quote-unquote great or Craig Truglia? Who should you side with? Because Photius the quote-unquote great in Mystagogy of the Holy Spirit 68 says, quote, read through Ambrose or Augustine, or whatever father you may choose, they have written so, and the words, the Spirit proceeds from the Son, are to be found in their writings. If they slipped and fell into error, therefore, by some negligence or oversight, for such is the human condition. End quote. So your own saint and protector of orthodoxy affirms that St. Ambrose and St. Augustine probably taught the hypostatic filioque and fell into error. Will you listen to your own protector of orthodoxy or Craig Truglia, who stands alone in affirming that St. Augustine rejected the filioque? Please let me know. Now at the 8 minute 57 second mark, Craig Truglia moves on to my argument from On the Trinity, Book 5, 15. Let's rewatch the argument I make in my video. In On the Holy Trinity, Book 5, Chapter 14, 15, he says, But in their mutual relation to one another in the Trinity itself, if the begetter is a beginning in relation to that which he begets, the Father is a beginning in relation to the Son, because he begets him. It must be admitted that the Father and the Son are a beginning of the Holy Spirit, not two beginnings. But as the Father and the Son are one God and one Creator, and one Lord relatively to the creature, so are they one beginning relatively to the Holy Spirit. But the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is one beginning in respect to the creature, as also one creator and one God." End quote. So first he says that the Father is a beginning in relation to the Son, because he begets him. Clearly this is talking about the eternal hypostatic origin of the Son from the Father, not about energies, not about economy. Now afterwards he says, the Father and the Son are beginning of the Holy Spirit, not two beginnings. So this is about eternal hypostatic origin. The Father and the Son are one beginning of the Holy Spirit because they spirate as one common principle, exactly as the Council of Florence says. They are not two principles of the Holy Spirit, but they're one common principle. Two persons with one common principle of spiration. Now at the 10 minute mark, Craig's argument is that the previous quote is about economy. So this is pertaining to the economic procession, not to the hypostatic procession. If therefore that also which is given, the Spirit has him, Jesus, for a beginning by whom it, the Spirit, is given, since it, the Spirit, has received from no other source that which proceeds from him, the Son. So clearly, the Spirit has the Son as beginning in reference to his temporal sending forth to mankind. That is the context, Augustine continues. It must be admitted that the Father and Son are a beginning of the Holy Spirit, not two beginnings, but as the Father and Son are one God and one Creator and one Lord relatively to the creature, right? Because it's about the temporal procession. So are they one beginning relatively to the Holy Spirit. But the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is one beginning in respect to the creature as also one Creator and one God. All right? And so we can see the context of what Duan quoted. Anyone who has actually read the whole paragraph cannot help but look back at him like, really? Like, you know, these people here? Eternal origins are not even remotely the topic of discussion. Response. False. It is true that the quote preceding the verse I use is about the economy, but the entire argument is that from the economy we know the theology. Therefore, we know from the economy that the Son is a principium 
or hypostatic beginning of the Holy Spirit. The point of comparing the Father and the Son as a beginning to the Holy Spirit, to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit as a beginning to the creature, is to show that they are one principle, not two principles. We see in De Trinitate, Book 5, Chapter 13, quote, Therefore, God is spoken as one beginning to the creature, not as two or three beginnings, end quote. So this comparison does not mean it pertains to temporal procession, rather indicates that the Father and Son are one principle of the Holy Spirit. Now let's read De Trinitate Book 5 in context to see that it's actually pertaining to the imminent procession. In Book 5, Chapter 11, we see, quote, But whereas in the same Trinity, some things severally are specially predicated, there are in no way said in reference to themselves in themselves, but either in mutual reference or in respect to the creature. End quote. So when we speak relatively about the Trinity, it can be according to their mutual reference or their divine relations or relative to the creature. Now in Book 5, Chapter 13, we see Augustine say, quote, The Father is called so, therefore relatively, and he is also relatively said to be the beginning, and whatever else there may be of the kind. But he is called the Father in relation to the Son, the beginning in relation to all things which are from him. End quote. So the Father's name is relative to the Son, according to their intra-Trinitarian relations, and he's called a beginning of creation, according to God's relation to the world. Now in Book 5, Chapter 14, we see that the chapter begins with the following, quote, but in their mutual relation to one another in the Trinity itself. If the begetter is a beginning in relation to that which he begets, the Father is a beginning in relation to the Son because he begets him. But whether the Father is also a beginning in relation to the Holy Spirit, since it is said, he proceeds from the Father, is no small question. End quote. So the Father is relatively called a beginning of the Son because the Father begets the Son. So the Father being principium or beginning of the Son is not about economic procession, Rather, it's with regards to the intra-Trinitarian relations once again, which is why the chapters preceding this are all about the divine relations contrasted to God's relation to the creatures. So literally, St. Augustine is going step by step through the chapters, talking about the divine relations versus God's relation in the world. And then he talks about how principium, or beginning, can be spoken of as relatively to the creature, or it can be spoken about with regards to the intra-Trinitarian relations and the divine person's hypostatic origin. What does this mean? This means the entire context of chapter 14 refers back to the intra-Trinitarian relations and whether the Father and the Son are a beginning or principium of the Holy Spirit, meaning whether the Holy Spirit hypostatically proceeds from the Father and the Son. Now there are verses about the Father and the Son's economic relation to the Holy Spirit in this chapter, but from this economic relationship, we see that St. Augustine draws the following conclusion, quote, If therefore that also which is given has him for a beginning by whom it is given, since it has received from no other source that which proceeds from him, it must be admitted that the Father and the Son are a beginning of the Holy Spirit, not two beginnings. But as the Father and Son are one God and one Creator and one Lord relatively to the creature, so are they one beginning relatively to the Holy Spirit. But the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is one beginning in respect to the creature, as also one Creator and one God. End quote. The very argument employed is that the Father and the Son being a principle of the Holy Spirit in economy is based on the Father and the Son being a beginning of the Holy Spirit in their intra-Trinitarian relations. And the Father and the Son being a hypostatic beginning of the Holy Spirit is compared to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit being a beginning of creation because they are one principle of creation, not two or three principles. Hence, in Book 5, Chapter 13, we hear, quote, Therefore God is spoken of as one beginning in respect to the creature, not as two or three beginnings. End quote. So this is explicitly the Florentine teaching of the Filioque. The Father and the Son are one principium, or one beginning, of the Holy Spirit, not two principles. If you are like Craig Truglia, and read this as the Father and the Son being one economic beginning of the Holy Spirit, then the chapter makes no sense. The question at the beginning of the chapter was about the intra-Trinitarian relations, as we hear, quote, but in their mutual relation to one another in the Trinity itself, if the begetter is a beginning, in relation to that which he begets, the Father is beginning, in relation to the Son, because he begets him. But whether the Father is also a beginning in relation to the Holy Spirit, since it is said he proceeds from the Father, is no small question. End quote. Craig's interpretation of the passage makes no sense in light of the paragraph's context, because the entire answer to the question proposed is not addressed in what follows. According to Craig Truglia, St. Augustine asked a question regarding the hypostatic origin of the Holy Spirit and ended up not answering at all, and rather went on a tangent about economic processions, which supposedly had no connection to the imminent trinity. Furthermore, Craig's interpretation makes no sense of the logic employed by the preceding chapters, which first talk about the intra-trinitarian divine relations, and then he talks about how principium, or beginning, can be spoken of as relatively to the creature, or it can be spoken about with regards to the intra-trinitarian relations 
and the divine person's hypostatic origin. And finally concludes with the assertion that the Father and the Son are one principium, or beginning, of the Holy Spirit. According to Craig, there is no connection between the logic of the preceding chapters, and he thinks that St. Augustine was bringing up divine relations and what principium means with regards to the divine relations just to talk about economic processions. Furthermore, Craig thinks that the Father and the Son being a beginning of the Holy Spirit is pertaining to the economic trinity, because the line preceding this says the Spirit is the Spirit of both. Now what St. Augustine is actually doing is arguing from economy to theology, or saying that the possessive case reveals hypostatic origin. In fact, in Book 5, Chapter 12, St. Augustine says, quote, So also we speak of the Holy Spirit of the Son, but we do not speak of the Son of the Holy Spirit, lest the Holy Spirit be understood to be his Father. End quote. St. Augustine is clearly connecting the genitive case or possessive case to the hypostatic origin of the persons. As he says, if we call the Son the Son of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit would now be the person of the Father. Or in other words, you've made the Holy Spirit into the hypostatic origin of the Son, which is false and ridiculous. Given this logic, in Book 5, Chapter 14, when St. Augustine says the Spirit is the Spirit of the Father and the Son, he clearly deduces from the possessive case that the Holy Spirit has hypostatic origin from both the Father and the Son, which is exactly why he says they are one principium, or beginning of the Holy Spirit hypostatically. Truglia misreads Book 4, 29, and tries to disprove the Filioque with it. He says the Father is the beginning of the whole divinity, therefore the Filioque is false. Interestingly, there is a section Augustine actually gives a specific judgment on the question of eternal origins and on the Trinity. It is Book 4, Chapter 29. Augustine says the following, because also when he had said whom the Father will send, he added also in my name. Yet he did not say, whom the Father will send for me, as he said, whom I will send unto you from the Father, showing namely that the Father is the beginning, principium of the whole divinity, or if it is better so expressed, deity. He therefore who proceeds from the Father and from the Son is referred back to him from whom the Son was born. It should be noted, by the way, that the Council of Florence, as quoted by Duong, states, the Father and Son as from one principium and from one cause. Augustine literally contradicts Florence. The Father, not the Father and Son, is the whole divinity's principium. Response. The Father is beginning of the whole divinity because he is the unbegotten source and first person in the Trinity who possesses the divine essence of himself, so all processions flow forth from him. This in no way contradicts the Filioque. If you use the Trinitarian analogies of the Fathers, you can better understand this. The fathers compare the Trinity to a spring, river, and sea. The spring is the source of the water, and therefore is the principium of all the water. And the spring communicates the water to the river, and the river and spring communicate the water to the sea. So while the spring is the source of all water, and the principle of all the water's procession, the river plays an active role in communicating the water to the sea. Likewise, in the Most Holy Trinity, the Father is the source of all divinity, and he communicates the essence to the Son. Yet the Father and the Son both actively communicate the essence of the Holy Spirit, and this in no way takes away from the Father being principal of the whole Trinity. Furthermore, the very quote he cited affirms the Filioque. Let's read it in context with the surrounding chapters. On the Trinity, Book 4, Chapter 20, Paragraph 27 says the following, quote, But if the Son is said to be sent by the Father on this account, that the one is the Father and the other the Son, this does not in any manner hinder us from believing the Son to be equal and consubstantial and co-eternal with the Father, and yet to have been sent as son by the Father. Not because the one is greater, the other less, but because the one is Father, the other Son, the one begetter, the other begotten, the one, he from whom he is, who is sent, the other, he who is from him, who sends. For the Son is from the Father, not the Father from the Son. Because he was not sent in respect to any inequality of power or substance or anything that in him was not equal to the Father, but in respect to this, that the Son is from the Father, not the Father from the Son. For the Son is the word of the Father, which is also called his wisdom. What wonder, therefore, if he is sent not because he is unequal with the Father, but because he is a pure emanation, Manasio, issuing from the glory of the Almighty God. For there, that which issues and that from which it issues is one and the same substance. Chapter 21 says, quote, If God the Father had willed to appear visibly through the subject creature, yet it would be most absurd to say that he was sent either by the Son, whom he begot, or by the Holy Spirit, who proceeds from him. End quote. The entire logic here is that the sending of the Son from the Father has its basis in the imminent procession, meaning he is from the Father or that he proceeds or issues forth from the Father as begotten of the begetter. Chapter 21 says the Father is not sent based on his lack of an origin, as he does not proceed from the Son or the Spirit. So the economic sending is based on the imminent processions and reveals them. But doesn't St. Augustine say, quote, 
The Son, therefore, is not properly said to have been sent in that he is begotten of the Father. End quote. Correct. Sending does not formally denote begetting. Rather, it has its basis in begetting. If you don't adopt this view, you make St. Augustine contradict himself when he says, quote, For as to be born in respect to the Son means to be from the Father. So to be sent in respect to the Son means to be known to be from the Father. End quote. De Trinitate, Book 4, Chapter 20, 29. Now let's continue with Chapter 20, Paragraph 29. Quote, For as to be born in respect to the Son means to be from the Father. So to be sent in respect to the Son means to be known to be from the Father. And as to be the gift of God in respect to the Holy Spirit means to proceed from the Father. So to be sent is to be known to proceed from the Father. Neither can we say that the Holy Spirit does not also proceed from the Son. For the same Spirit is not without reason said to be the Spirit both of the Father and the Son. Nor do I see what else he intended to signify when he breathed on the face of the disciples and said, Receive the Holy Ghost. For that bodily breathing proceeding from the body with the feeling of bodily touching was not the substance of the Holy Spirit, but a declaration by a fitting sign that the Holy Spirit proceeds not only from the Father, but also from the Son. But the various of madmen would say that it is one Spirit which he gave when he breathed on them, and another which he sent after his ascension. So the Spirit of God is one, the Spirit of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, who works all in all. But that he was given twice was certainly a significant economy, which we will discuss in its place as far as the Lord may grant. That then which the Lord says, whom I was sent unto you from the Father, shows the Spirit to be both of the Father and of the Son. Because also, when he said, whom the Father was sent, he added also, in my name. Yet he did not say, whom the Father was sent from me. As he said, whom I was sent unto you from the Father. Showing namely, that the Father is the beginning, principium of the whole divinity, or if it's better, so expressed deity. He therefore who proceeds from the Father and the Son is referred back to him from whom the Son was born. End quote. So St. Augustine says, quote, Neither can we say that the Holy Spirit does not also proceed from the Son, for the same Spirit is not without reason said to be the Spirit both of the Father and of the Son. End quote. The economy reveals theology, the point that St. Augustine is making when we call the Spirit the Spirit of both, this is because he proceeds from both hypostatically. And remember, St. Augustine argues that the economic processions reveal the imminent origins of the persons. So the Holy Spirit proceeding from both economically reveals his imminent origin from both. Then concerning the Son breathing the Holy Spirit in the economy, St. Augustine says it is a declaration by a fitting sign that the Holy Spirit proceeds not only from the Father, but also from the Son. Now, if the economic breathing is a sign that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son, this clearly means that he says that the Holy Spirit hypothetically proceeds from the Father and the Son. A sign points to another reality. Likewise, the temporal procession, which is a sign, points to another reality. It doesn't point to the temporal procession. Rather, it points to the imminent procession. Craig Truglia falsely reads this as pertaining to economic procession. In his interpretation, the economic procession of the Holy Spirit from the Son is a sign of the economic procession of the Holy Spirit from the Son, which is absurd and makes no sense, showing Truglia has a completely false interpretation. St. Augustine is saying that the economic breathing forth of the Spirit from the Son points to the eternal breathing forth of the Spirit from the Son. Now let's move on to the very quote Craig Truglia uses. Quote, The Father is the beginning, principium of the whole divinity or if it's better so expressed, deity. He therefore who proceeds from the Father and from the Son is referred back to him from whom the Son was born." End quote. The very fact that the Father is the principium of the whole divinity does not contradict the following statement, which says the Holy Spirit proceeds from both. St. Augustine literally affirms both in the same passage. The Father is the principium of the whole divinity, and the Holy Spirit hypostatically proceeds from the Father and the Son. And from the argumentation in the paragraph, that economy reveals theology, we are sure that this is referring to the hypostatic procession, that's the whole point St. Augustine was making. The Holy Spirit proceeding from both here is derived from the fact that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of both and from the fact that the Son breathing the Spirit in economy is a sign of the Spirit's eternal origin. Showing economic actions points to hypostatic origin. Craig literally uses a pro-filioque quotation to try to debunk the filioque. How absurd. This shows he might have read the text, but he has little understanding of what the text actually says. The Father is a principium because he's the unbegotten source of the divinity. All deity flows forth from him. This in no way contradicts the Holy Spirit proceeding from both as one principium, which St. Augustine explicitly confirms in Book 5, as we have already proved. At the 13 minute 23 second mark, Truglia asserts Augustine contradicts the Council of Florence. The Father and Son as from one principium and from one cause. Augustine literally contradicts Florence. The Father, not the Father and Son, is the whole divinity's principium. Response. The Father is the beginning of the whole divinity because he possesses it from no other. This in no way contradicts the fact that the Father and the Son are one beginning of the Holy Spirit. In fact, the Council of Florence in session 6 literally affirms this when they say, quote, The Latins asserted that they say that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son 
not with the intention of excluding the Father from being the source and principle of all deity, end quote. Showing what St. Augustine said is literally in line with Florence. Now, Craig Drugli at the 14 minute 28 second mark quotes against Maximinius the Arian, book two, and tries to show that only the Father is the principle of the Holy Spirit. In response to Max Minus, book two, chapter 14, verse one, Augustine writes, the Son comes from the Father. The Holy Spirit comes from the Father. The former is born, the latter proceeds. Hence, the former is the son of the father from whom he is born, but the latter is the spirit of both because he proceeds from both. When the son spoke of the spirit, he said he proceeds from the father because the father is the author, or in Latin, that literally means it's author, which means originator, of his procession. The father begot a son, and by beginning him, gave it to him that the Holy Spirit proceeds from him as well. So I could already see the objection. Augustine says the Spirit proceeds from the Son as well. Well, to answer this objection, I'd respond that Augustine is likely referencing the temporal procession here because he literally identifies the Father as the octor, or originator of the eternal procession. While inferring primary and secondary causes, as I'm sure Duong would do, is theoretically possible for reasons I will soon cover, such inferences are without justification. Now, if you actually read against the Maximinus the Arian book two in context, it literally teaches the filioque. Let's take a look, quote, you ask me if the son has the substance of the father and the Holy Spirit also has the substance of the father, why is one a son and the other not a son? Look, here's my answer whether you get it or not. The son comes from the father, the Holy Spirit comes from the Father. The former is born, the latter proceeds. Hence, the former is the Son of the Father, from whom he is born, but the latter is the Spirit of both, because he proceeds from both. When the Son spoke of the Spirit, he said, He proceeds from the Father, John 15, 26, because the Father is the author of his procession. The Father begot a Son, and by begetting him, gave it to him that the Holy Spirit proceeds from him as well. If he did not proceed from him, he would not say to his disciples, Receive the Holy Spirit, John 20, 22 and give the Spirit by breathing on them. He signified that the Holy Spirit also proceeds from him, and showed outwardly by blowing what was given inwardly by breathing. If he were born, he would be born not from the Father alone, or from the Son alone, but from both of them. He would beyond any doubt be the Son of both of them. But because he is in no sense the Son of both of them, it was necessary that he not be born from both. He is therefore the Spirit of both, by proceeding from both." End quote. Okay, so it says that the Holy Spirit proceeds from both because the Father in beginning the Son gives the Son the procession of the Holy Spirit. Clearly, if the Son received the Spirit's procession from the eternal generation, this is pertaining to an eternal procession of the Holy Spirit, not a temporal one. So this is not with regards to the economic trinity. Furthermore, St. Augustine quotes John 20:22 20, and says the Son breathing the Holy Spirit signifies the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son. So the economic procession is a sign of the imminent procession. The economic procession is not a sign of the economic procession. That makes no sense. Furthermore, St. Augustine says, if the spirit were born or generated, he would be the son of both of them. But since he's not born, meaning he simply proceeds, he's the spirit of both and proceeds from both. This clearly shows that the context is about hypostatic origin and the Holy Spirit hypostatically proceeds from both. There's no way around it. Being born from both means having hypostatic origin from both. Proceeding from both means having hypostatic origin from both. Now let's read the next paragraph, quote, and speaking of that most excellent nature, who can explain the difference between being born and proceeding? Not everything that proceeds is born, though everything that is born proceeds, just as not every biped is a human, though every human is a biped. These things I know, I do not know, I cannot, I am unable to distinguish the generation in this procession. The reason is that both of them are ineffable. The prophet says, speaking of the Son, who will tell of his generation? So too it is truly said of the Spirit, who will tell of his procession? It is enough then for us that the Son does not come from himself, but from him from whom he is born. The Holy Spirit does not come from himself, but from him from whom he proceeds, since he proceeds from both of them. As we have already shown, he's called the Spirit of the Father and the Spirit of the Son." End quote. So this paragraph is about the distinction between generation and procession, which are both pertaining to hypostatic origin, not economic procession nor eternal manifestation. Now regarding the distinction between generation and procession, St. Augustine affirms, quote, the Holy Spirit does not come from himself, but from him from whom he proceeds, since he proceeds from both of them. As we have already shown, he's called the Spirit of the Father and the Spirit of the Son, end quote. In other words, the Spirit does not have hypostatic origin from himself, but rather he has hypostatic origin from whom he proceeds, which is the Father and the Son. And this is why the Spirit is called the Spirit of the Father and the Son. Clearly this text, which Craig Truglia quotes, 
when read in context, teaches the filioque, showing that Craig is wrong and should not be trusted for interpreting texts. Now Craig Truglia uses one of St. Augustine's most obscure Trinitarian analogies and falsely interprets it to disprove the filioque. Minds will envision. In the preceding illustrations, the origin principium octor is the first item, like the mind or the lover. The second item, love or will, is the spirit which proceeds from the father towards the desired end. The end is knowledge, beloved vision, the sun. This is not complicated if one follows any of the illustrations. So we're going to cover the psycholo one, only one psychological trinity in detail. And that's going to be mind, will, vision. In review, mind is the father, will is the spirit, vision is the sun. I chose this one because in book 11 of On the Trinity, I find Augustine's illustration to be the easiest to follow for the average reader. As we've already seen from St. Augustine's clear words, he believes in the filioque, so no amount of cope can get you to evade this clear teaching. Furthermore, if you actually read when St. Augustine uses his psychological analogies for the Trinity, it is clear that he's teaching the filioque. Furthermore, elaborating on the psychological analogy, in Book 15, Chapter 26, St. Augustine says, quote, Are we therefore able to ask whether the Holy Spirit had already proceeded from the Father when the Son was born, or had not yet proceeded, and when he was born, proceeded from both. Wherein there is no such thing as the sync times, just as we've been able to ask, in a case where we do find times, that the will proceeds from the human mind first, in order that that may be sought which, when found, may be called offspring, which offspring being already brought forth or born, that will was made perfect, resting in the sin, so that what has been desired when seeking is its love when enjoying, which love now proceeds from both, i.e. from the mind that begets and from the notion that is begotten, as if from parent and offspring, and these things it is absolutely impossible to ask in this case, where nothing is begun in time, so as to be perfected in the time following. Wherefore, let him who can understand the generation of the Son from the Father without time, understand also the procession of the Holy Spirit from both without time. And let him who can understand in that which the Son says, as the Father has life in himself, so has he given to the Son to have life in himself. Not that the Father gave life to the Son already existing without life, but that he so begot him apart from time, that the life which the Father gave to the Son by begetting him is co-eternal with the life of the Father who gave it. Let him, I say, understand that as the Father has in himself that the Holy Spirit should proceed from him, so has he given to the Son that the same Holy Spirit should proceed from him and be both apart from time, and that the Holy Spirit is also said to proceed from the Father, as that it be understood that the proceeding also from the Son is a property derived by the Son from the Father. For if the Son has of the Father whatever he has, then certainly he has of the Father that the Holy Spirit proceeds also from him. But let no one think of any times therein, which imply a sooner and a latter, because these things are not there at all. How then would it not be most absurd to call him the Son of both, when just as generation from the Father, without any changeableness of nature, gives the Son essence, without beginning of time, so procession from both, without any changeableness of nature, gives to the Holy Spirit essence without beginning of time. For while we do not say that the Holy Spirit is begotten, yet we do not therefore dare to say that he is unbegotten, lest anyone suspect in this word either two fathers in the Trinity, or two who are not from another. For the Father alone is not from another, and therefore he alone is called unbegotten, not indeed in the Scriptures, but in the usage of disputants, who employ such language as they can on such a great subject. And the Son is born of the Father, and the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father principally, the Father giving the procession without any interval of time, yet in common from both, Father and Son. But he would be called the Son of the Father and of the Son, if a thing abhorrent to this feeling of all sound minds, both had begotten him. Therefore the Spirit of both is not begotten of both, but proceeds from both." End quote. So the procession of the Holy Spirit from the Father and the Son is timeless, and is compared as love which proceeds from the mind that begets, and the begotten word. The psychological analogy of mind word love is pertaining to the distinction of persons in the divine processions, as the Son being begotten word of the mind is pertaining to his hypostatic origin. So the Holy Spirit being the love that proceeds from both is about hypostatic origin. So clearly this is not about the economy of salvation, so it's not an economic procession. Additionally, this procession of the Holy Spirit from the Son is given to the Son by the Father in the very act of generation, once again indicating this is about hypostatic procession. Furthermore, St. Augustine says, Quote, be understood that his proceeding also from the Son is a property derived by the Son from the Father. End quote. So the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Son is a hypostatic property, not an eternal manifestation, nor an economic procession. Finally, this personal property comes from the fact that the Son derived the aspiration of the Spirit from the Father, showing the Father's principal cause. 
Notice St. Augustine says, quote, The Father, without any changeableness of nature, gives to the Son essence, without beginning of time. So the procession from both, without any changeableness of nature, gives to the Holy Spirit essence, without beginning of time. So the Holy Spirit derives essence from both, which directly contradicts the Eastern Orthodox Council of Blackernay, Thomas against Beckos, Canons 4 and 5, which says the Holy Spirit cannot receive being from the Son or through the Son. So there's no way to assert that St. Augustine is compatible with Eastern Orthodox pneumatology. Craig has to distort the clear meanings of the text to avoid the filioque, which St. Augustine so explicitly teaches multiple times in the text and says this is in harmony with his psychological analogies. Craig misinterprets an obscure psychological analogy of the Trinity and uses it as a hermeneutic for reinterpreting the clear filioque text in St. Augustine. This shows Craig cannot be trusted for interpreting texts. Finally, St. Augustine states, quote, The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father principally, the Father giving the procession without any interval of time, yet in common from both Father and Son. But he would be called Son of the Father and of the Son, if, a thing abhorrent to the feeling of all sound minds, both had begotten him. Therefore the Spirit of both is not begotten of both, but proceeds from both, end quote. So the Father is the principal cause of the Holy Spirit, because he has the aspiration of the Spirit from no other, yet the Son from all eternity is given the aspiration of the Holy Spirit, so he proceeds from both eternally, and this is why the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of both. In short, Craig Truglio's interpretation of St. Augustine is completely off, and he's ignorant of St. Augustine's clear words. Remember, Photius the quote-unquote great in Mystagogy of the Holy Spirit, 68, says, quote, Read through Ambrose or Augustine, or whatever father you may choose. They have written so, and the words the Spirit proceeds from the Son are to be found in their writings. If they slipped and fell into error, therefore by some negligence or oversight, for such is the human condition, end quote. So your own saint and protective orthodoxy affirms that St. Ambrose and St. Augustine probably taught hypostatic filioque and fell into error. Will you listen to your own protective orthodoxy or Craig Truglia, who stands alone in affirming that St. Augustine rejected the filioque? Please let me know in the comment section. Now let's rewatch my argument from St. Hilary teaching the filioque in On the Trinity, Book 2, Paragraph 29. In On the Holy Trinity, Book 2, Chapter 29, he says, Concerning the Holy Spirit, I ought not to be silent, and yet I have no need to speak. Still, for the sake of those who are in ignorance, I cannot refrain. There is no need to speak, because we are bound to confess him proceeding, as he does, from Father and Son. Patre et filio octoribus confitendus. So clearly, St. Hilary is a filioquist. Objection. In Ed Sechensky's book on the filioque, he writes, quote, The problem is that while this text can be understood to mean that we are bound to confess him proceeding as he does from Father and Son, a better reading might be confess him on the evidence of the Father and the Son. Reply to objection. The term that St. Hilary uses is patre et filio octoribus confitendus. In medieval Latin, as opposed to classical Latin, the meaning of octor is usually causer, founder, or originator. Octor is a word used more than a dozen times in On the Trinity. In all of these other usages, it's always using the term to pertain specifically to the fact that the Father is the Son's author or origin. So, St. Hilary thinks that the Holy Spirit has both Father and Son as his octor or his eternal origin because he proceeds from both. So sorry, Dr. Sachensky, but you're wrong. In fact, top Eastern Orthodox apologist Craig Truglia on his blog admits this. In a comment on his blog, he says, John, I agree with your rendering of the Latin personally which is why I find the passage problematic to the Orthodox. It can certainly be read according to the Roman Catholic view. Granted, Hillary is not clear enough, but I think the simpler explanation, given to the stress he puts on the word octor, is he's talking about the Spirit's origin. We could use mental gymnastics to say that he's really saying something Orthodox somehow, but this would not be the simplest explanation. At the 27 minute 23 second mark, Craig Truglia and Father Patrick Ramsey asserts that St. Hilary, when calling the Father and the Son Octor of the Holy Spirit, is referring to authority, not originators. So he is saying the existence of the Spirit is obvious based on the authority of what the Father and the Son say regarding the Spirit. Now, Duan rightly points out that St. Hilary appears to call the Father and the Son authors, or Octor, same word that Augustine used, of the Spirit in Book 2. Now, I have found several translations translate author to be reporters, confessors, proclaimers of the Spirit. Hillary has used the term octor to mean this as well. This is something I've covered on my channel. So what we're going to do is share a screen here, and we're going to play um, Father Patrick Ramsey um, telling us about exactly how this works. So let's go. He is confessed from originators of authorities, which are the father and son. What is the significance of that turn and phrase compared to the paraphrase of the popular translation? Right. Well, in this particular case, um, autoritas, I can't pronounce it very well, can mean author, um, but it also has a sense of um, originator or authority. 
And Hillary uses it elsewhere as, as authority, the word in its various forms he, he, he uses as authority. And what he means by this is by the authority of the, a, a father or, or, or on what they said. So this here is we're confessing the existence of the Holy Spirit on what authority? On the words of the scriptures, on what the Father says through, through various scriptures in the Old Testament, etc., and for what the Son says when he speaks of the Spirit. Now, Book 2 has large portions covering the hypostatic properties of the persons. In a few paragraphs prior, it's about the ingeneracy of the Father, the begetting of the Son, and answering the Sabellian heresy, or modalism. Recall that Book 2.11 says, quote, The Son draws his life from the Father, who truly has life, the only begotten from the unbegotten, offspring from parent, end quote. So clearly this is about hypostatic origin. Then in Book 2, Paragraph 23, he says, quote, Let Sibelius, if he dare, confound father and son as two names with one meaning, making of them not unity, but one person, end quote. So the context is about the distinction of persons and the divine processions. Then in Book 2, Paragraph 29, we get to the Holy Spirit. Now if the context of the previous paragraphs is about the distinction of persons and the divine processions, or lack thereof, what should we expect? The paragraph about the Holy Spirit should talk about his special property and the divine processions. So when St. Hilary says, Quote, concerning the Holy Spirit, I ought not to be silent, and yet I have no need to speak. Still, for the sake of those who are in ignorance, I cannot refrain. There's no need to speak, because we are bound to confess him, proceeding as he does from Father and Son. Qui patriot filio octoribus confitendus. End quote. Now, if octors used a dozen times in On the Trinity, meaning author of procession, and if the context of the previous paragraphs is about the hypostatic properties of the persons, and the distinction between the persons, and answering the modalist heretics, what does this mean? It means the Father and the Son are the author of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit hypostatically proceeds from both. Craig Truglia and Father Patrick Ramsey's reading that the term octoribus refers to reporter or authority makes no sense in light of the context. Therefore, their reading is probably false, and my reading is correct. So, St. Hilary is a filioquist. Now at the 29 minute 46 second mark, Craig Truglia tries using Book 8 of On the Trinity to interpret what St. Hilary means by the Father and the Son being octave of the Holy Spirit. Craig claims my quote from Book 8 is about temporal procession, not the eternal procession. Let's revisit my argument from Book 8. In Book 8 to Chapter 20, he says, Accordingly, he receives from the Son, who is both sent by him and proceeds from the Father. Now I ask whether to receive from the Son is the same thing as to proceed from the Father. But if one believes that there's a difference between receiving from the Son and proceeding from the Father, surely to receive from the Son and to receive from the Father will be regarded as one and the same thing. For our Lord himself says, Because he shall receive of mine and shall declare it unto you, all things whatsoever the Father hath are mine, Therefore, I said, he shall receive of mine and declare it unto you. That which he will receive, whether it will be power or excellence or teaching, the Son has said must be received from him. And again, he indicates that this same thing must be received from the Father. For when he says that all things whatsoever the Father hath are his, and that for this cause he declared that it must be received from his own, he teaches also that what is received from the Father is yet received from himself, because all things that the Father hath are his. Such a unity admits no difference, nor does it make any difference from whom that is received, which given by the Father is described as given by the Son." End quote. So St. Hilary's asking, is proceeding from the Father the same thing as receiving from the Son? His answer is yes, and they'll be regarded as one and the same thing. So he believes the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son and receives from both Father and Son. And St. Hilary's justification for this is John 16, where we see the Holy Spirit receives of Christ because the Father has given him all things, right? He says, quote, He teaches also that what is received from the Father is yet received from himself, because all things that the Father hath are his, end quote. And so this matches with the argument we made in the previous video, where the Father communicates all to the Son except paternity, the Father spirates, therefore the Son spirates. It's just in the reverse direction. The Holy Spirit receives from both Father and Son, because the Father has given all things to the Son, including the spirit of power. Objection! St. Hilary does not affirm the filioque. His answer was only about reception, as he said, surely to receive from the Son and to receive from the Father will be regarded as one and the same thing. He was not talking about procession. Reply to objection. St. Hilary can interchange receive and proceed, because proceeding from the Father and the Son simply means that the Holy Spirit receives the divine essence from both. The same way that saying that the Father generates a Son entails the Son receiving essence from the Father, so the Holy Spirit receiving from both simply means he proceeds from both, or that both Father and Son actively spirate. Furthermore, if you deny this, you have to say that St. Hilary asked a question about procession at first, which he did not at all address in the entire paragraph dedicated to answering that question. 
which is absurd. Now Craig claims this is merely an economic procession, not the hypostatic procession. Now Duong references book 8 paragraph 20 stating that the procession of the spirit being given to the son is a reference to eternal origins, proving a Florentine filioque. Yet anyone who has read all of book 8 paragraphs 19 to 20 can readily surmise topic and issue is not the eternal procession, but the temporal procession. Response. In On the Trinity, Book 820, St. Hilary says, quote, That which he will receive, whether it will be power or excellence or teaching, the Son has said must be received from him. And again, he indicates that this same thing must be received from the Father, end quote. So the Holy Spirit is said to receive power, excellence, and teaching from the Son. Interestingly enough, St. Hilary believes power is identical with essence, as he says the Father and the Son are identical to divine power due to divine simplicity. In Book 2, 8, he says, quote, For he is the offspring of the unbegotten, one from one, true from true, living from living, perfect from perfect, the power of power, end quote. So if the Son and the Father are identified as power, it means power is the divine being itself, as each person is the divine being. So the Holy Spirit receiving power from the Son means he receives the divine being or essence from the Son. Furthermore, in On the Trinity, Book 7, 27, we see, quote, All that is within him is one. What is spirit is light and power and life, and what is life is light and power and spirit, end quote. So St. Hilary explicitly teaches divine simplicity, that all the divine attributes are identical to the divine essence, and that power is a divine attribute. So what does St. Hilary mean when he says the Holy Spirit receives power from the Father and the Son? It means this is the reception of essence from the Father and the Son, or this is about hypostatic procession, not an economic one. This is why St. Augustine knew that John 16 points to an eternal reception, not a merely temporal one. Now Craig claims Book 8, Paragraph 26 is about the economic procession. Therefore, the quote I use is about the temporal procession. In Paragraph 26, Hillary sums it all up and makes it abundantly clear he's referencing the temporal procession as he literally frames the question by saying the following. When the Spirit of Christ dwells in us, this indwelling means not that any other spirit dwells in us than the Spirit of God, but if it is understood that Christ dwells in us through the Holy Spirit, we must yet recognize this Spirit of God as also the Spirit of Christ. And since the nature dwells in us as the nature of one substantive being, we must regard the nature of the Son as identical with that of the Father, since the Holy Spirit, who is both the Spirit of Christ and the Spirit of God, is proved to be a being of one nature. I ask now, therefore, how can they fail to be one by nature? The Spirit of truth proceeds from the Father. He is sent by the Son and receives from the Son. Craig fails to realize that the fathers constantly switch from talking about economy to theology. Their arguments is that what happens in economy reveals what happens in the imminent trinity. The reason we know the father is unoriginate or from no other is because he's not sent by the son nor the spirit. So the economy reveals the theology. Remember, St. Augustine taught this in De Trinitate. The reason we know the spirit has hypostatic origin from both is because the Holy Spirit proceeds from both in economy or because the Holy Spirit receives from the Son. This is the type of argument that St. Hilary is making, which is identical to the argument St. Augustine makes in De Trinitate. Furthermore, the quote from Book 8, Paragraph 26 says, quote, I ask now, therefore, how could they fail to be one by nature? The Spirit of Truth proceeds from the Father. He is sent by the Son and receives from the Son. But all things that the Father has are the Son's. And for this cause, he who receives from him is the Spirit of God, but at the same time the Spirit of Christ. The Spirit is a being of the nature of the Son, but the same being is of the nature of the Father. End quote. Okay, so the Holy Spirit receives from the Son, and the following sentence says, All things the Father has are the Son's. And this is why the Holy Spirit receives from the Son. Then the following verse says the Spirit is a being of the nature of the Son. Now clearly the argument St. Hilary is using is that the Father communicates all to the Son except paternity, the Father spirates, therefore the Son spirates. This is why the Holy Spirit is said to receive from the Son, and this is why the Spirit is of the nature of the Son. This is not about mere consubstantiality. Rather, it's about consubstantiality by the mode of receiving the divine essence from the Son. Remember, St. Augustine in Tractate 99 says, Due to divine simplicity, all attributes are identical to the divine essence. So if a person receives a divine attribute from another, he must be said to receive the divine essence from that person. Now, if you recognize this logic, St. Hilary is saying that the Holy Spirit receives from the Son. So what does this mean? It means the Holy Spirit has the divine essence from the Son because he proceeds from him. This is why Photius, the quote-unquote great in Mystagogy of the Holy Spirit, clearly says the Spirit cannot be said to receive from the Son, otherwise this implies hypostatic origin from the Son. Remember Photius in Mystagogy of the Holy Spirit, Book 2, 22 says, quote, What other hypostasis from whom the Spirit is said to receive could be meant other than the Father? Because it cannot be, 
as has been recently contended against God, that he receives from the Son, and it certainly cannot be from the Spirit, who himself does the receiving. End quote. Yet St. Hilary says the Holy Spirit receives from the Son, indicating hypostatic origin. Furthermore, Craig Truglia never even addresses the fact that St. Hilary concludes on the Trinity with the following, quote, Let me in short adore you, our Father, and your Son together with you. Let me win the favor of your Holy Spirit, who is from you through your only begotten. End quote. So the Holy Spirit is from the Father through the Son, and this is pertaining to hypostatic origin. As the Holy Spirit being from the Father is about hypostatic origin. Remember the Council of Blackerne, Thomas against Pecos, Canons 4 and 5, assert that the Holy Spirit cannot be said to receive being through the Son or from the Son. But if the Holy Spirit hypostatically proceeds from the Father through the Son, this implies a filioque. So we see Book 2, Paragraph 29, which asserts the Father and the Son are the author of the Holy Spirit, matches perfectly with the fact that the Holy Spirit hypostatically proceeds from the Father through the Son. Meaning the Council of Florence is right when they assert, quote, Texts were produced from divine scriptures and many authorities of Eastern and Western holy doctors, some saying the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, others saying the procession is from the Father through the Son. All were aiming at the same meaning in different words, end quote. St. Hilary shows the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son is substantially identical to the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father through the Son, as he uses both formulas. Now let's rewatch the argument I made from St. Athanasius. Let's see what the great St. Athanasius has to say about the filioque. In his first letter to Serapion, St. Athanasius says, Quote, on the other hand, the Son sends the Spirit. For if I go, he says, I will send the paraclete. The Son glorifies the Father, saying, Father, I have glorified you. Whereas the Spirit glorifies the Son, who says, He will glorify me. The Son says, Those things which I have heard from the Father are what I speak to the world. While the Spirit in turn receives from the Son, He will take from what is mine, He says, and declare it to you. The Son came in the name of the Father, whereas the Son also speaks of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. Therefore, since the Spirit has the same relation of nature and order with respect to the Son, that the Son has with respect to the Father, how can the one who calls the Spirit a creature escape the necessity of thinking the same about the Son?" End quote. So St. Athanasius acknowledges some things about the Son to Father relation. The first thing is that the Son glorifies the Father. The second is that the Son hears from the Father and declares Him. The third is that the Son comes in the name of the Father. And the fourth is that the Father sends the Son. St. Athanasius draws parallels to the Spirit to Son relation. He says, the Spirit glorifies the Son, the Spirit hears from the Son and declares Him, the Spirit comes in the name of the Son, and the Son sends the Spirit. So from this parallel, he draws the conclusion that the Spirit has the same relation of nature and order with respect to the Son that the Son has with respect to the Father. Now, what is the Son's relation of nature and order to the Father? Well, the Son receives essence or nature from the Father, and he's ordered posterior according to origination to the Father, right? The Father's first person because he's from no one, and the Son is second person because he's from the Father alone. Well, if the Spirit has the same relation of nature and order, with respect to the Son, that the Son has with respect to the Father, what does this mean? It means the Holy Spirit receives essence or nature from the Son, and he's ordered posterior to the Son. And this explains why the Holy Spirit is a third person in the Holy Trinity, because he receives essence from Father and Son, and so he's ordered third. Furthermore, Saint Athanasius says, how can one who calls the Spirit a creature escape the necessity of thinking the same about the Son? Clearly, once you understand that Saint Athanasius is saying that the Holy Spirit receives essence from the Son, you can understand his argument. If the Spirit receives the same essence of the Son, and if the Spirit's a creature, then you're obligated to say that the Son's a creature because he has the same essence. So clearly, this is not about energies, this is about nature, and this is not about economy. So St. Athanasius is a filioquist. At the 34 minute 44 second mark, Craig's reading of St. Athanasius ad Serapium is that they all have the same divine nature. Now, Duong infers that the quote, the same relation of nature and order between the Father and Son, is that the Son comes after the Father and attains his essential nature from the Father. Now, presuming upon such a reading, following Duong's logic, he infers that the Spirit taking the same relation of nature and order from the Son ranks the Spirit's causal relationship after the Son, just as the Son's is after the Father, and this demonstrates he attains to his essential nature from the Son. Yet even without the surrounding context, Duong's interpretation and very long string of inferences does not make sense. There's nothing controversial about the Spirit having the same, the quote, relation of nature and order with respect to the Son, because the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all have the same divine nature. The same exact point his contemporary, Hilary Poitier, was making in proving a corollary, a corollary. As a reminder, Hilary's point was that by being indwelt by the Spirit, we are also indwelt by Christ due to their shared divine nature. So the same relation of nature and order is that they share divine essence and all rank as God. 
Response. Relation of nature and order refers to the divine relations and the order of the persons, not to economic procession nor eternal manifestation nor mere consubstantiality. So this is about the hypostatic relation of one to another. In other words, this isn't about mere consubstantiality. The son's relation of nature and order to the father is that he receives nature from the father and is ordered posterior to the father, since the father is his principle. The Holy Spirit's relation of nature and order to the son is that he receives nature from the son and is ordered posterior to the son, because the son is the spirit's principle. This connects perfectly with St. Gregory of Nyssa's Contra Unomius 142, where he says, quote, For as the son is bound to the father and, while deriving existence from him, is not substantially after him, so again the Holy Spirit is in touch with the Only Begotten, who is conceived of as before the Spirit's subsistence according to the idea of cause. So the order of the persons is based on the hypostatic causality. The Father is the first person, since he is from no one. The Son is second person, since he is from the Father. And the Holy Spirit is the third person, since he is from the Father and the Son. But in Ad Serapion, we're at the paragraphs before, talking about sanctification and the economy. Yes, from the economy, we draw inferences to theology. That's the argument St. Athanasius makes. That's the argument basically all the fathers make. That's the entire logic of all his works, defending the divinity of the Son. He's extending the same principle to show the Holy Spirit receives existence from the Son. And if the Holy Spirit receives existence from the Son, then if the Holy Spirit is a creature, you are bound to confess the Son is a creature. That's the argument he's making. The argumentation shows that this is pertaining to the reception of essence and the hypostatic relations of the persons. Now let's add some more arguments for the Filioque from St. Athanasius Ad Serapion. I'm getting these arguments from Scholastic Answers, Christian B. Wagner. Quote, We shall find that the Spirit has to the Son the same proper relation, idiotita, as we have known the Son to have to the Father. Quote, Because he, the Spirit, is proper to the Word who is one, he is proper to God the Father who is one, and one in essence with him. End quote. So the Spirit's hypostatic relation to the Son is the same as the Son's to the Father, and clearly the Son's hypostatic relation to the Father is that the Son has hypostatic origin from the Father, so the Spirit has hypostatic origin from the Son. This is why the Spirit being proper to the Word makes him proper to the Father. The Son is the middle link which unites the Father to the Spirit. We see St. Athanasius say, First, that if the Spirit knew, much more must the Word know, considered as a Word, from whom the Spirit receives. Discourse 3 against Arians, chapter 28, paragraph 44. Wait a second. So the Spirit receives knowledge from the Son, but knowledge is only received by the communication of the Divine Essence, not through the energies, nor by economic procession. And we already debunked the Essence-Energies distinction. And we showed that Philotheos Kokinos, a Palamite saint, doesn't even believe in the Essence-Energies real distinction, therefore undermining the basis for eternal manifestation and energetic procession. In the previous video. Go watch the previous video if you want to see more on that. Remember what St. Augustine said, Of whom he has essence, of him he has knowledge, from him therefore he has hearing. But St. Athanasius says that the Holy Spirit receives knowledge from the Son. But that must mean he receives essence from the Son. Therefore, St. Athanasius is a filioquist. This is why St. Athanasius says, For he, as has been said, gives to the Spirit, and whatever the Spirit has, he has from the Word. So everything the Spirit has, he has from the Son? Does the Holy Spirit have essence, existence, and being? Yes or no? If you say no, you are no longer a Trinitarian, and you aren't a Christian anymore. If you say yes, then when St. Athanasius says, Whatever the Spirit has, he has from the Word. What does this mean? Well, it means that St. Athanasius is a filioquist because the Holy Spirit has essence, existence, and being from the Word, which is what the Eastern Orthodox Council Blackne dogmatically condemns when they say in the Thomas Ketzbeckos Canon 5, For there is no other hypostasis in the Trinity except the Father's, from which the existence and the essence of the consubstantial, the Son and the Holy Spirit, is derived. So, it is clear that St. Athanasius is a filioquist. At the 49 minute 38 second mark, Craig Truglia asserts I misread Epistle 39, which has St. Cyril stating that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. I made that assertion in my video. I did not say that Epistle 39 taught the filioque. Actually listen to what I said. The only time the procession of the Holy Spirit comes up in letter 39 is in the following quote, where he says, quote, But the Spirit himself of God and of the Father, who proceedeth also from him, and is not alien from the Son, according to his essence. End quote. In no way is this either confirming or denying the filioque. Theodore read that into the text. Now the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father in no way contradicts the filioque. This is affirmed by both Eastern Orthodox and Catholics. Furthermore, Craig cannot deal with the quotes that show that St. Cyril clearly teaches the filioque. Let's revisit them. St. Cyril of Alexandria is a saint both East and West. He lived from 376 to 444 AD. In his work, The Treasury of the Consubstantial Trinity, Thesis 34, we see him say, quote, it is necessary to confess the Spirit to be from the essence of the Son, for existing from Him according to nature. End quote. In the same work, he also says, The Spirit proceeds pro esai from the Father and the Son. Clearly, He is of the divine substance, 
proceeding pro-ion substantially, usiodos, in it and from it. So the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, and this explains why he's of the divine substance. So clearly this is about the communication of the divine essence, and he proceeds substantially in it and from it. So clearly this is about the communication of the divine essence, or the eternal hypostatic origin of the Holy Spirit, or the eternal procession of the Holy Spirit. It's not about energies, not about economy. Elsewhere he says, quote, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God the Father as well as of the Son, and comes forth substantially from both. That is, from the Father through the Son. The Holy Spirit comes forth substantially from both. From the Father through the Son. Sounds just like per filium and filioque. Elsewhere he says, The Spirit is called the Spirit of truth, and Christ is truth. And so he flows forth from him as from God the Father. Thank you, St. Cyril of Alexandria, for affirming that the Holy Spirit, 1. Has essence and receives existence from the Son. 2. Proceeds substantially from the Father and the Son. 3. Comes forth substantially from the Father through the Son. And 4. The Holy Spirit flows forth from Christ, just like he flows forth from the Father. Now, Craig Truglia misreads questions at the last 63 from St. Maximus the Confessor and says it does not teach the filioque. So from this, Juan concludes that Maximus taught that the Spirit's hypostatic uh, causation or existence is caused by both the Father and the Son. However, the whole passage in Father Maximus Constus translation reveals that St. Maximus is citing the temporal procession. Let's revisit it. Quote, by nature, Fuse, the Holy Spirit, according to the essence, Catusion, takes substantially, Usiorus, his origin, ek pruamanon, from the Father through the Son who is begotten. By nature, the Holy Spirit, according to the essence, takes substantially his origin from the Father through the Son who is begotten. End quote. So the context is with regards to nature, essence, and substantial origin, using the term ek pruamanon, which is in reference to the hypostatic origin. So clearly, the Holy Spirit receiving origin from the Father through the Son means he receives his being from the Father through the Son. All four indicating marks shows that this is about hypostatic origin. Not economy, not eternal manifestation. Even if the next line says that the Holy Spirit distributes energies, that doesn't mean that it's teaching eternal manifestation and the Neopalamite doctrine of the essence energy's real distinction. Energies just means activities, and we affirm that the imminent processions is the basis for the economic processions and the distribution of activities or energies. That's something that we affirm. There's absolutely no way you could read this in any other way, which is why Craig Truglia is wrong. Remember the Council of Blackernay, Thomas against Beckos, Canon 4, says the Holy Spirit cannot be said to receive being through the Son. This would imply that the Son is cause and source of the Spirit, but this is exactly what St. Maximus the Confessor is confirming. Now, Craig Truglia also misreads Questionis et Dubia, question 134, and asserts it's not teaching the filioque. The context is literally about how the genitive case only works in one way, because the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son. The Son cannot be called the Son of the Holy Spirit because he does not proceed from the Holy Spirit. Let's reread Questions and Doubts, question 134. Quote, that it is not possible to say that Christ is of the Spirit, as in the case of the Father and of the Son. It is said indifferently, the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ. Just as the noose or the mind is a cause, a tias, of a word, so also the Father is a cause, a tias, of the Spirit through the mediation of the Logos. And just as we are not able to say that the word is of the voice, neither can we say that the Son is of the Spirit. Now the Father as the mind is a tias or hypostatic cause of the word. So the Father as the mind is a tias or hypostatic cause of the Spirit through the mediation of the Logos, meaning this is pertaining to hypostatic origin through the Son, which is explicitly condemned at the Eastern Orthodox Council of Blackernay. This is why the Spirit is called the Spirit of the Son, but the Son is not called the Son of the Spirit, since the Spirit has origin from the Son, but the Son does not have origin from the Spirit. That's the exact argument at play. Interestingly enough, Saint Ephraim the Syrian, a saint both east and west, uses the same Trinitarian analogy as Saint Maximus, and he sees it in line with the Filioque. In De Defunctus et Sancta Trinitate, he says, quote, The Father is the begetter, the Son the begotten from the bosom of the Father, the Holy Spirit, he that proceedeth from the Father and the Son. The Father is the mind, the Son is the word, and the Spirit is the voice. End quote. Saint Ephraim enumerates the hypostatic properties of the persons, as being unbegotten and being begotten is pertaining to hypostatic origin, not energetic procession nor economic procession. So the Holy Spirit proceeding from both is pertaining to hypostatic origin, which means St. Ephraim is a filioquist. So St. Maximus the Confessor, who uses the same exact Trinitarian analogy and asserts the Father is a cause or a tias of the Spirit through the mediation of the Word, is clearly teaching the Holy Spirit has hypostatic origin from the Father through the Son, something explicitly condemned at the Council of Blackernay. The voice proceeds from the mind and the interior Word. Furthermore, he connects this to the fact that we call the Spirit the Spirit of the Son, but we cannot call the Son the Son of the Spirit. So the possessive case is indicative of hypostatic origin. Now Craig Truglia says that I uncritically imposed the primary secondary cause Latin distinction on St. Maximus' letter to Marinus. False. In the letter to Marinus, St. Maximus literally says his letter is in agreement with the Latin Fathers and St. Cyril's commentary on John. But we already showed that the Latin Fathers teach a filioque, 
and that Latin fathers like St. Augustine have the distinction between principal cause and cause simpliciter. At the 1 hour, 6 minute, and 40 second mark, Craig Truglia asserts I misinterpret St. Ambrose, who merely teaches the temporal procession, and he asserts that I juxtapose my own logic. Wang also mishandles Ambrose by juxtaposing his own interpretation of Sirach in another book of Ambrose on a different matter and logically extrapolating the paragraph 120s and reference the eternal procession when it's just not. Now what I actually do is demonstrate that the context is about hypostatic origin, as I showed that St. Ambrose believes Sirach 24.5 is clearly about hypostatic origin. So I just show that the context is about hypostatic origin. Let's rewatch my video. Let's move on to St. Ambrose. He's a saint both east and west, and he lived from 340 to 397 AD. In On the Holy Spirit, Book 1, Chapter 11, 120, he says, quote, Lastly, wisdom so says that she came forth from the mouth of the Most High, as not to be external to the Father, but with the Father. For the Word was with God, and not only with God, but also in God. For he says, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But neither when he goes forth from the Father does he retire from a place, nor is he separated as a body from a body. Nor when he is in the Father is he as if a body enclosed as it were in a body. The Holy Spirit also, when he proceeds from the Father and the Son, is not separated from the Father, nor separated from the Son. For how could he be separated from the Father, who is a spirit of his mouth? Which is certainly both a proof of his eternity, and expresses the unity of this Godhead." End quote. So we see St. Ambrose starts off by saying that wisdom proceeds from the mouth of the Father, quoting Sirach 24.5. Now clearly this is referring to the eternal generation of the Son, and he even says that this is not external to the Father, so this procession is an imminent procession. And didn't St. Ambrose, in exposition of the Christian faith, say, quote, His generation is in relation to a personal attribute, for the wisdom of God saith, I came forth out of the mouth of the Most High. So St. Ambrose clearly thinks that Sirach 24.5 is talking about the eternal generation of the Son, not about energies and not about economy. So, the procession of the Holy Spirit from both is in context of the divine processions. And so, if the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, and is not separated from the Father nor separated from the Son, this is clearly St. Ambrose expressing his belief in the Filioque. And that's why at the end he says this is proof of his eternity and expresses the unity of this Godhead. The Filioque in the communication of the numerically one divine essence expresses the unity of the Godhead and it's proof of his eternity. So it's not temporal. So clearly this is not about economy or about energies, meaning St. Ambrose is a Filioquist. At the 1 hour, 6 minute, 56 second mark, Craig Truglia says Nicaea too has St. Tarusius rejecting the Filioque. Now, let's also just very briefly talk about Duong's sighting of Nicaea too. It's counterintuitive. St. Tiresias in Nicaea II was condemned by the Franks for not teaching the Son as part of the eternal cause of the Spirit. So literally, that part of Nicaea II was condemned for not being pro-Florentine, the Florentine filioque. To this, Pope Adrian I defended Tiresias' confession by quoting Augustine, Athanasius, Hilary Poitier, Cyril of Alexander, and Pope Gregory, teaching the temporal as opposed to eternal procession. Just read the quotes. In other words, the Pope was opposing the Franks who were expounding Florence's view um, just in centuries in advance by affirming the view that the Father alone is the eternal cause of the Spirit and the Son's role is temporal. See Mendham's translation, pages 91 93. Now my point I make in the video is that the debates in Nicaea 2 is whether the Holy Spirit hypothetically proceeds from the Father and the Son or whether the Holy Spirit hypothetically proceeds from the Father through the Son, which are both condemned by the Eastern Orthodox Council of Blackernay. So the point I was making is that the debates at Nicaea 2 are totally opposite to what the Eastern Orthodox teach. Let's rewatch the clip from my old video. Now let's move on to Patriarch St. Tarsius of Constantinople. He's a saint both East and West, living from 730 to 806 AD. At the 7th Ecumenical Council, Nicaea 2, he professes in the Nicene Creed that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son using the term ek pruamanon. Clearly, this is about hypostatic origin, as the term ek pruamanon is talking about hypostatic origin. Furthermore, it's in addition to the Nicene Creed, which is not about energies nor about economy. So this is about the Holy Spirit's hypostatic property. He's a saint both East and West, at an ecumenical council, in the profession of faith, saying this, which the Eastern Orthodox Dogmatic Council of Blackernet condemns. Interestingly enough, the Franks were accusing him of heresy for only affirming hypostatic per filium, not filioque. Notice, He's accused of heresy for not adopting the filioque. He's not accused of heresy for taking the position of the Holy Spirit proceeding through the Son. Rather, he was accused for not admitting the filioque. Interestingly enough, for modern Eastern Orthodox, admitting the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son 
or proceeds from the Father through the Son hypostatically would anathematize you. So at the Seventh Ecumenical Council, we see that what they're debating is completely inverted to what the modern Eastern Orthodox believe. Now, Pope Hadrian wrote a letter in defense of St. Tarsius, and basically he affirms that both hypostatic perfilium and filioque are asserting the same thing, and both are acceptable. If you want to read this, go to Adam Grove's translation of the letter. Furthermore, Pope Hadrian writes a letter asserting both hypostatic filioque and hypostatic perfilium are acceptable, vindicating the Council of Florence, which asserts both are substantially identical. Now, Craig Truglia believes Hadrian's letter is about the economic trinity only, but the entire context is about whether the Holy Spirit hypostatically proceeds from the Father and the Son, or if he proceeds hypostatically from the Father through the Son, as this was the entire dispute in the Creed, and the Creed's about hypostatic origin, not about economic procession, not about energetic procession. Now, the following is from Adam Grove's translation of Hadrian's letter. Reporting from the Acts of the Council that Tiresias had confessed that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son, Charlemagne charges him with the mistake of not confessing the filioque, that is, that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Interestingly, the modified version of the Nicene Constantinople Creed, including the filioque, must have by this time been so well established for the Franks that it was thought to have been included in the original version of the Creed, drawn up at the First Council of Nicaea. It is surprising then that Pope Hadrian didn't simply correct this error of fact in responding to this charge. After all, the filioque was not then in liturgical use in Rome. Already then, we see that Adrian, like his latter papal successors, distinguishing between theology of the filioque, which was accepted as true, and the prudential decision of adopting it liturgically or exclusively. In defending Tiresias' formulation that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son, it is clear that Pope Adrian confesses what the contemporary catechism of the Catholic Church teaches, namely that the origination of the Spirit through the Son and the origination of the Spirit from the Son are complementary, not contradictory formulas of the same faith. CCC 248. Interestingly, Pope Adrian's response focuses on assembling the patristic evidence from the incident in John 20, where Jesus breathes on the apostles and says, Receive the Holy Ghost. For this, he traces a line from St. Athanasius through St. Augustine to St. Gregory, which sees the breathing as a definitive proof of not just of the economic sending of the Spirit for the purpose of our salvation, but also the eternal relations of the second and third persons. In this, Pope Adrian seems to be faithfully following the principles set out by the Cappadocian Fathers. The economy can reveal the eternal unity of substance and the subsisting relations. Now, in Pope Adrian's letter, he uses proof text from the Fathers to show that both hypostatic perfilium and hypostatic filioque are acceptable. The Church Fathers argue from the economic procession of the Holy Spirit to the eternal origin of the Holy Spirit. Craig fails to recognize this, which is why he's absolutely confused, and thinks that the entire letter is only about economic procession. Let's look at some of the proof texts that Pope Adrian uses to prove the hypostatic filioque is in line with the hypostatic perfilium. Pope Adrian writes, quote, Likewise, the work of the same Saint Athanasius concerning virginity, among the rest, and in the Holy Ghost, who having being in the Father and the Son, goes forth from the Father and is given through the Son. Et in spiritum sanctum qui in patria et filio existence, end quote. Now in this quote, we see that the Holy Spirit has existence in the Father and the Son. Having existence in the Father and the Son means he receives being from them. Now this quote is actually by Pseudo-Athanasius, but the point of this is to show that Pope Hadrian believes in the hypostatic filioque, and his entire letter is defending the hypostatic filioque and hypostatic perfilium. Pope Adrian goes on to say, quote, and in Book 4, Chapter 10 of the same St. Augustine's On the Trinity, among other things, nor can we say that the Holy Spirit does not proceed from the Son as well, for neither is it in vain that the same Spirit is called the Spirit both of the Father and of the Son. Nor do I see what else he wishes to signify, in what blowing on them, he said, receive the Holy Ghost. Neither was that corporeal blowing, through proceeding corporeally from the body by the sense of touch, the substance of the Holy Spirit, but it was a demonstration by a fitting indication that the Holy Spirit proceeds not only from the Father, but also from the Son." End quote. Remember, St. Augustine here is arguing that the Son breathing the Holy Spirit in the economy is a sign of his eternal procession from the Son. Pope Adrian is using this in defense of the filioque and hypostatic perfilium. Pope Adrian continues by saying, Likewise in St. Cyril's works on the worship of the Spirit, from the first book, among other things, just as he is the Spirit of God and of the Father, and at the same time also substantially of the Son, proceeding from both that is from the Father through the Son, and the rest, end quote. Clearly this is St. Cyril affirming the Spirit being substantially from the Son, not about economic procession. So Pope Adrian is using this to prove that the filioque is identical to the perfilium formula. Furthermore, Pope Adrian says, quote, for this reason also the remarkable preacher and honey-tongued doctor, Pope St. Gregory, in his homily 26 on the Holy Gospel, said the following, among other things, when the paraclete comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, for if to be sent ought to be understood as only to be incarnated, beyond doubt the Holy Spirit, who was in no way incarnated, in no way ought to be sent. But his sending is his very procession, by which he proceeds from the Father and the Son. Therefore, just as the Spirit is said to be sent because he proceeds, thus also the Son is not unfittingly said to be sent because he is begotten. End quote. In this verse by Pope St. Gregory, 
He asserts the son's economic procession from the father has its basis on the son's hypostatic origin from the father. Likewise, the spirit's economic procession from the father and the son has its basis on the spirit's hypostatic origin from both. So clearly, Pope Adrian's letter is a complete defense of St. Theresius and affirms the hypostatic filioque and hypostatic profilium and says both are acceptable, which is taught by the Council of Florence, whereas the Eastern Orthodox Council of Blackerney rejects both. Notice St. Theresius teaches the hypostatic profilium at an ecumenical council showing Catholicism is true. Craig is absolutely wrong in his analysis of the situation and does not know what he's talking about. In short, Craig Truglia's video against my video is completely wrong, and he gets basically every point wrong. This also shows you cannot trust Craig Truglia's interpretation since he gravely misreads all the fathers presented in the video and fails to realize that the fathers unanimously argue from economy to theology as a proof for the filioque. Now, a YouTuber named Jim Apologetics was cheering on Craig in the comment sections, saying it's so over for the filioque enthusiasts. This shows this guy either hasn't gone to verify Craig's claims or also has a false interpretation of the fathers like Craig. Additionally, this guy made a completely erroneous video on the filioque, and his comments on Craig's channel shows you cannot trust this guy in the filioque either. Attached below are articles by my friends against Craig Truglia. So the filioque is universally taught by the church fathers, therefore it's true, and the Eastern Orthodox are wrong in the filioque. So Catholicism possesses the fullness of truth. Remember, Vatican II in Lumen Gentium 14 dogmatically states, quote, Whosoever, therefore, knowing that the Catholic Church was made necessary by Christ, would refuse to enter or to remain in it, could not be saved, end quote. In short, you should become Catholic if you want to avoid hell. If you're an Eastern Orthodox who is now having an existential crisis, pray the Rosary. Our Lady has appeared multiple times proving Catholicism and telling us to pray the Rosary. Research the miracle of the Son at Fatima. Thank you for watching my video. Let us close in glory be. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, word without end. Amen. Thank you guys for watching. Have a good day. Despite his errors, please do not leave mean messages about Craig Truclia in the comment section. Thank you.